Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Roy Evans of the Jericho Broadcast Networks, and I am here with Mr. Darren Reed, who is the Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development. Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Roy. Glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks. So let's start off by telling the folks a little bit about what Stride Professional Development is. Yeah, absolutely. Stride uh, is a is the nation's leading uh, provider of online education in the K through twelve space. We were formerly known as K twelve Inc. and uh, are you know over two decades in the space of providing um, free virtual online education across the nation to students, no matter where they are. Um, We've since changed our name to Stride uh, because we're, we, we've done expanded beyond the K-12 space, though, though that's still very much what we do as a priority. Um, what we've also done with the Stride Professional Development Center is we've leveraged some of our expertise over the past two plus decades of supporting schools and students and educators, teachers, principals. Um, and we are trying to innovate, you know, the way professional development happens for educators and that we're doing that through the Stride Professional Development Center. Um, gone are the days where, you know, it's face-to-face -face only PD, um, it's episodic professional development, um, it's professional development that's not necessarily relevant to what teachers and educators need right away. So the Professional Development Center is designed to solve that challenge with some unique and uh, innovative uh, ways of delivering content. All right, man. Well, listen, we are super excited here at the network to be engaged with you all and helping to provide this opportunity for teachers all across the country, and especially those teachers that are coming from our HBCU backgrounds, because we Absolutely. know that education was always one of the stalwarts of most HBCUs in this country. They all had teaching programs, and that's what a lot of them were founded for. So, there. let's talk absolutely. a little bit about those special programs that you guys have for yeah. the teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Roy, you hit, you hit on the very important point. Um, you know, right now in our country, we're facing, facing probably one of the greatest challenges you know, of our teaching core that we have in many, many years. And that, that's around this teacher shortage. You know, a lot of teachers are exiting the profession um, um, just just based on tenure. You know, they're, they're retiring and moving on. And then you have, you know, our existing teachers who are, who are being taxed and stressed, you know, particularly post-COVID with, you know, increasing demands, um, challenges that they're facing in the classroom, and a host of other, other uh, issues that, that they struggle with. And, um we need good teachers and we need to support the teachers that we have. So the two things that we're doing um, is that we know first year teachers among all teachers are among the first to leave the profession uh, within the first five years. I think they do um, at, at a 44% rate, which is just scary to think that folks are, you know, graduated, want to go in a classroom and make a difference, but, you know, feel like they need to leave within the first five years because it's so challenging. So we want to support them. Um, obviously, as a new teacher, your school that you 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 work, you, where you work your first year, the district where you work, there will be some professional development support to assist you. But we want to go a step further. We want to help every teacher in the country get off to a strong start uh, to their first year and have some uh, stick to itiveness, you know, to help them get through that first year. So we're offering a year free. Um, access to the Stride Professional Development Center. It's an ever-growing online database of courses that will help them in a variety of different ways, uh, classroom management, targeted instruction, uh, and, and a host of other things. And the content will continuously grow. Again, it's just another resource that allows them to sharpen their practice, to feel like they're supported, uh, because the research says that teachers are leaving in large part because they don't feel like they get enough professional support. So we really hope that helps new teachers. So again, this is for any new teacher who just graduated in the country. All you have to do is go to our site and uh, sign on using the Teachers Win uh, uh, discount at, at, at checkout. Also, we have a, a, another campaign where during Teacher, Appreciate, teacher Appreciation Week, we gifted uh, all teachers in the country, no matter where you are, six months free professional development center access uh, but we're doing a special thing with through you, our partnership with the B BCSN and our, our uh, HBCU graduates and, and also the schools that you work with. We want any teacher in the country who, who, who you know, through our partnership um, gets access to the Professional Development Center and they get six months free using the BCSN 23 uh, passcode at, at checkout. You know, again, our goal is to support and get as many teachers on the site feeling supported, um, you know, to really help, you know, them, them succeed and have some success, not only for them, but obviously for our kids and the communities they serve. So. 
Most definitely. And Darren, listen, we are super excited again to be a part of this. My mother was a teacher. My aunt was a teacher. I have my my best friend is a teacher. Absolutely. So we understand. I've worked in the school system for years. So I understand the resources that are needed. I understand why a lot of these teachers do take the time and they sit there. And after going through college, they're like, you know what? Let's do something different. Yeah. So we're happy to be a part of this to help you guys change that. So ladies and gentlemen, here's all you guys need to do. All you need to do is take a look and go to the link that's right below us right now and see what you're going to do. You're going to see two links on the page now, just to make sure. The top one takes you to their professional development page, homepage, that'll let you know about some of the things that are happening there and the things that you have access to. Go to the second link that says teacher appreciation. That'll take you directly to the content page where you can sign up and get your free year if you're a new teacher and your free six months if you're an existing teacher. Let's show them how we utilize resources and we make sure that we take time, those folks who are HBCU alum, and use this. And let's see what Stride has to offer. We're excited about it. We know you will be too. Darren, is there anything else that you'd like to say to the folks? No, I mean, just, you know, as a teacher myself, you know, and and um, understanding the need. Um, and, and of course, with the, you know, the, the diversity that's needed in our teaching core across the country, you know, I know our HBCU teacher graduates are just, uh, exactly what we need in our community. So I really encourage them and just glad to be doing this partnership with you all. All right. Well, folks, there you go again, Mr. Darren Reed, Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development Learning. We will be seeing you guys, and trust me, you'll be seeing more from their partnership with us as we move forward, always trying to do our best to make sure that we move forward with the community. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. I love my HBCU uh. and bar. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU yeah. and man. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah, yeah, I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a lot. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Yeah. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. The team is back again the second week in August, or is it the first week in August? How does it go? Anyway, close. welcome to episode 417 inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast that is covering the sporting HBC dash, all things HBC sports from institutions large and small, from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics, to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs in the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cabello, along with my co-host, Mike Bosch and Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live. KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer, that is, Ralph Cooper, in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Gentlemen, I did my due diligence. I have sent over the shirt sizes. Yes, that includes you, Roy. I made sure your size is in there. You saw the text that I asked you, and you sent it back. So all that information is over there. And Raymond Holly, a silent producer in the back there, uh, as he does the work, making sure we posted everything on Twitter, uh, as well as threads and YouTube, along with Chris. I did get a shirt for you, too, as well shirt size for you too as well Raymond so I done my diligence I asked for golf caps I asked for golf caps because I say we coming I don't play golf but I wear it y'all play golf can we get can, can we get some golf caps I asked, <laughs> I asked for you know I'm not sure where that lands but I did ask for it and the big thing is that means we need to plan a trip to make sure we can get on the golf courses. That's yes. where it's going to be really paid dividends. That, that, point, that point right there. Yeah, got to. <laughs> <laughs> so I plan to make sure I get some frequent fly miles getting into that area. With that, that being said, 
Charles, how you doing today? Doing well, Doc. I want to uh, send a shout out uh, to all the uh, social media teams out there doing a great job of putting out content uh, for all these uh, various teams, first few days of camp, and to the athletic trainers. They're doing yeoman uh, work, especially in this 105, 110 degree heat. Uh, and I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's the first few days of camp. You know, it's 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 discipline, it's projectile vomiting, it's a lot of stuff going on. But uh, the athletic trainers are out there doing uh, all their due diligence to keep these guys hydrated and keep the field clean. So I want to send a shout out to everybody. Well said, well said. With that, before I come to you, Mike, let me get in a shout out. And we're going to do this early on here. Shout out to some of the lab listeners, Jeff Roberts. We're getting closer to kickoff. Brother Gerald Wayne Joseph, president, past president, I should say, of Alpha Eight Atlanta. Ride. Big Aggie time. Ride. <laughs> Big time <laughs> alumni of Texas Southern University. Saw him down there at the Nationals in Dallas a week ago. Mary Allen, hello, everyone, HBCU land. Jeff Roberts, Jerome Jeep Sutton, Lonnie Shaw. Man, the folks are in the building, chilling in the lab. That's right. Carol Keelan, Theron Waters. Hey, guys. Chuck Hunt. Hell Wildcat, Silas Edward McMorris, Carol Keelum, good evening, lab, PV in the house. Uh, Silas says, good evening, everyone, PV in the lab. Man, PV up in the deep. That's right. Holly, good evening, lab rats. Karen Griffin, TU, Tuskegee University in the lab. That's right. Chuck Hunt right. says, checking in from Monroe, Louisiana, good evening. Aggie Roberts. Uh, Jeff Roberts says, Aggie Pride, that's what you were referencing. There, yep. Yep. Aggie Mary Pride. Allen, Jerome G. Sutton, make sure y'all know that Rally Mania is good <laughs> in here on time. Mary Allen says, let the countdown begin, HBCU football season. With that being said, Mike, how you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. I'm trying to stay cool. Uh, I, I echo with uh, my guy there, CB. Uh, we tried to get some golf together this past weekend, but it didn't quite work out. <laughs> My line brother caught a stomach and he had the passes. So we tried to get on the course, but we couldn't. But uh, uh, with all the folks going back to camp, I echo what CB says. And, hey, you know, they, they doing, they're doing a yeoman's job to keep these, these young athletes. But that's why you got so many people chilling in the lab because it's too hot to be outside. So <laughs> they chilling. They literally are chilling in the lab. Third, I have to say it. The, the internet is undefeated with all that we saw at Montgomery. Man, all the memes. I got to give up to all the folks that came with the memes, the movies, all of the stuff, because I couldn't work for half a day, my wife and I, because we were so busy laughing at the memes, just the memes from that Montgomery incident. So uh, that's what I got going on today. Well said. Y'all going to learn not to play with them folks in Alabama. I know y'all hope they pick on Alabama State, Alabama A&M, college field. Hey, the goat, Tuskegee. The goat, the goat held strong this past week. Yeah, y'all going to held strong. Strong. <laughs> Especially oh, in man. Alabama State and Montgomery. Let them know. I don't play with yeah. the folks down there. I know. I already like, this, this, they learn. This is not the 60s anymore. <laughs> like, I love you. It's you. It go just as hard in a lot of ways in the 60s. They were getting it done. Shout out to all those brothers that put us in a position to be here. But I will say this, like uh, Alan likes to, and, and you've seen a lot of the, those, that graph when we talk about uh, on the mathematic side, mess around and find out. I know they say it in different words, but uh, somebody certainly connected the dots there. With that being said, today's episode of Inside HBC Sports Lab was sponsored by THE Agency LLC. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. With that being said, I'm going to come back to you, Mike. Uh, what's some news out there on, on your side? What are you, what are you interested in and what has you excited this week in HBCU Sporting News? Well, man, we got quite a bit going on. So <clears throat> we got Alabama State, uh, uh, has, has, they're with our president. Dr. Quentin T. Ross Jr. has been named member of the NCAA Committee on Women's Athletics, announced by the NCAA. Now, there's a number of folks that have been announced to this committee. So uh, just to give you a little background, the, the mission of this committee 
on uh, women's athletics is to provide kind of leadership, governance, uh, and associated with its efforts to provide equitable opportunities, fair treatment, yada, 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 in all aspects of intercollegiate athletics. This is a big deal committee. <clears throat> so basically, it's about governance, administration, and conduct of intercollegiate athletics um, at the institutional conference and national levels. This is a big deal to be named to this committee. So congratulations. He's currently, uh, Dr. Ross is currently in his fifth year as president of Alabama State University, having assumed the leadership role at his alma mater, I believe in 2017. His tenure has been marked by all kinds of stuff, transformative, innovative leadership, uh, done a terrific job with fundraising, expansion of national and global partnerships, advancement of all kinds of initiatives. Um, he's a three-time graduate of uh, Alabama, the, the, I guess I'll say the Alabama State University. I'll give them the credit this time, where he earned a bachelor's degree in political science, a master of education degree in secondary education, and a doctorate of education in educational leadership, policy, and law. He is a distinguished ed ed educator par excellence. So, and in 2022, President Biden announced the appointment of Dr. Ross, along with several additional qualified and diverse leaders of the president's board of uh, advisors on HBCUs. So uh, kudos to Dr. Ross on this announcement and that committee. Uh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous committee. A lot of, lot of work as that committee be, has been announced. So hats off to Dr. Ross. Yeah, President Ross, Dr. Ross there, he um, is solid in terms of his uh, athletic director hires as well as he uh, hired Dr. Jason Cable. Very strong, very strong over there. One of the top six I had on my list, top six mm. uh, in the mix. Uh, actually, number two overall, the way he fell there. So much credit to uh, Dr. Ross, President Ross, on all his accolades and the new movement, including Dr. Jason K was getting a lot of stuff done over there at Alabama State University. Coming to you, Charles, what's on your mind? What has you excited in the HBCU sphere this week? Yeah, a couple of big pieces of news coming from Jackson State. Let's start. Uh, Jackson State uh, to coach Tamiki Ree was named to the NCAA committee uh, uh, with regards to women's basketball. Uh, she has been selected as a member of the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Oversight Committee. Uh, as announced by the NCAA, the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Oversight Committee is responsible for ensuring uh, that appropriate oversight of the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball is maintained uh, for enhancing development and public perception of the sport and for making recommendations related to regular season and postseason competition, such as rule changes uh, and administration of the championship tournament. The committee also prioritizes the enhancement of the student-athlete educational experience from both the academic and athletic perspective, and in doing so, promote student athletes personal growth and leadership development. So kudos to Coach Tamika Reed for being named uh to this uh NCA uh, oversight committee. Coach Reed continues to get it done. Boy, I hate to see the the women of Jackson State University, you know they're gonna be that much more focused. They couldn't quite get it done in terms of the tournament last year. Remember they won the regular season. Mm -hmm. um, but I know they're coming back even stronger than ever, wanting to cut down some more nets. So that should be fascinating. Kudos. I know, I know, I know LSU. I, I know LSU is scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got another piece of uh, uh, news here from Jackson State. It's kind of one under the radar, but want to bring this out. Uh, Jackson State's men's and women's golf program. Uh, it was announced this That's past uh, Monday that uh, that has been dormant for years. It is coming back uh, with the support of President Anthony. We're bringing back men's and women's golf. Uh, we had a great tradition here. Coach Eddie Payton won with 30 championships in the golf program. So this is huge for Jackson State. And that's a quote uh, from athletic director uh, Ashton Robinson. So I'm uh, really, for me, really excited. Jackson State golf uh, coming back online. Uh, a lot of great uh, players that have uh, come through that golf program. My classmate, Tim O'Neill, uh, he's out there on the seniors tour right now. You've had Shasta Averhard with the LPGA tour. And another classmate of mine, A.J. Moxino. So he's uh, caddying on the PGA tour. Uh, for a young man, but he was on the bag for Y.E. Yang. Oh. Y.E. Yang uh, chased down Tiger back in 2009. So really excited. And, uh, you know, you know, Ashley likes to swing big for the fences. So uh, it'll be curious to see who will be leading this Jackson State golf program going forward. Awesome. Yeah, that's big That's big news. I know it's uh, a lot of pride personally in a lot of ways that you just shared with us for a lot of different reasons. 
Uh, so that's big time news. A lot of history with that program. So it's good to see it back in regards to um, them in Jackson State University being the tie that in. Let me go back to you, Mike. What else on your mind? Ah, we got we got a rattler, a rattler in the news. Yes, we got sir. Florida and M, Cincinnati Bengals legend, the late great Ken Riley. That's right. Applaud, salute, recognized as 2023 Pro Football Hall of Fame inductee on this past Saturday. So he's got a lot of stories behind with the rattlers. So I know we have a certain producer who happens to throw up that little rattler. Crooked side or whatever they do. So, <laughs> but in all honesty, I, I say that in just congratulations to him. And so, as a student athlete, Riley quarterback the offense for the legendary Alonzo Jake Gaither to a twenty-three and seven record and three Southern inter intercollegiate athletic conference association. Y'all simply put that's SIEC back then. Riley also uh, excelled in the classroom as he was a Rhodes Scholar. Wow. Wow. Hmm. wow. Data point. Yeah. Data point. Yeah. <laughs> Following playing at uh, a &M, he was selected in the sixth round in 1969. NFL draft by the Cincinnati Bengals owned by Paul Brown, who then moved Riley to cornerback. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, why are you moving him to cornerback? He didn't balk at it. He decided to do it, and in 15 seasons, 15 seasons later, he finished his career with 65 interceptions, which is fifth most all time. He was always known as always being consistent. He was an aggressive player, uh, man. Uh, having recorded at least one interception every every season and had a career high nine interceptions, I guess in 1976. Uh, Riley took five of those uh, those interceptions, those 65 interceptions to the house. He was part of the five playoff teams, made three interceptions in seven games and started in the Super Bowl 16, in which he recorded four tackles. So a lot of stats on him. So after retiring in 1983, Riley returned, uh, rejoined the, I'm sorry, the Green Bay Packers as an assistant head coach for two seasons before returning to the highest of seven hills as the head of foot, head football coach. Uh, he took over coaching duties for his alma mater in 1986 and <clears throat> had an eight-year stint, featured two MEAC championships and a pair of MEAC Coach of the Year honors following <clears throat> his time as head coach. He transitioned uh, to an administrative role uh, shortly later, but such an esteemed career. Congratulations. He uh, garnered inductions into the FAMU Athletics Hall of Fame in 1982, the Black College Hall of Fame in, in 2015, and the Cincinnati Bengals inaugural Ring of Honor in 2021. Congratulations, Big Ken Riley. Hats off to you. You're a rattler. I know, we, but we still love you. Tremendous, tremendous accolades. Special shout-out to his son, uh, Riley II, did an Excellent, awesome job in regards to his speech dedicated to his father. Obviously, his mom was there, family was there. Kudos and great job. Before we go to this break, let me shout out Jonathan Blackman. A few more weeks left until South Carolina State beat down JSU. Oh, so we get getting the smoke out already. Donna Shaw says Jonathan Blackman. Coach Buddy Pew got them ready. Huh? Emma Price is in there, says hello from Daytona Beach. Danielle Drew. Um, Jonathan Blacken said, Lonnie Shaw, I believe they'll be better than they were, uh, they have been in recent memory. Ebenezer Kwame is on here, HBCU Heritage Center. Um, so Jeff Roberts says, Elizabeth City State University has hired a new volleyball coach and chair coach. That was pretty cool to see that connection with one same state. Interesting. Stephen Gaither is in the building. I hate for Ross to lose. Uh, to the Rams so early in his tenure. It makes sense. <laughs> LaShawn Harris is joining us. Varick Williams, Go Jags. Lana Shaw, words on the street is Aggies have a second coming of number 28. Should be interesting. <laughs> so good talk, good bluster going on out there. Keep it going. We'll get you in the mix. We're going to take our first break. We'll come back on the other side, and we're going to get you into some football talk as we get in the fact that Charles went down to Prairie View and being able to get some insight in terms of what's going on down there. So if y'all have some folks out there that are going behind the scenes and covering HBCUs, you have some of the practice or interviews with coaches, 
send it our way. You can hit me up on Instagram or you can send it through Facebook if you would or Messenger and we'll see what we can to get some of this stuff up during the show. Make sure we can share our love throughout the process. But we're going to take advantage of this opportunity to come back on the other side and see what Charles has got up his sleeve. That being said, we'll take it to a break. We'll be back on the other side. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll everybody <laughs> we all go why not enjoy the go with Charmin at CDW we get speed as the new currency of success our team spends way too much time tending to outdated applications and software when they should be focused on driving application agility and innovation CDW Amplify development services modernizes software and application development to help accelerate innovation and digital transformation so you mean building new applications UI and mobile interfaces well you said you needed to innovate more quickly oh, so he's a listener to do more at scale, trust CDW Amplify Development Services. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University Sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU Athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to the Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Coach McDowell, you know, first few days of camp, uh, has everything kind of met your expectations thus far? Absolutely. You know, again, we want to make sure that these guys come in uh, as coaching, as the coaching staff, making sure they come in in shape and ready to go. Alvarez, Coach Alvarez, our strength and conditioning um, guy, has done a great job with the guys during the offseason and getting them in shape. We've been flying around the last four days, man, and that's what I keep telling them. Look, if we continue to do what we're doing out here, it's going to translate into the, into the, uh, to the field during, uh, during game day at some point. So they just got to continue to do it uh, consistently, especially when the body get tired, you know, I want to see exactly how they feel from day one to now, how their body feel, and obviously they came out pretty good off the weekend and, uh, and ran around today, which I was pretty happy with. They're competing, you know, as I told them, you know, they're iron sharpens iron, so, you know, and they're doing that and making each other better. Normally, the first few days of camp, the defense is a, a little bit in front of the offense. How's it been looking thus far? Yeah, I think they've been pretty even. I mean, it's you know, one day good for the offense. Next day, not good for them, then vice versa. You know, then defense will grab a good day. I think today was pretty even, you know, overall. And, and that's good. That, that's always a good thing. You know, you can say that your offense and defense did pre pretty good uh, on, during the same day. But again, still a long way from getting better. And you know, we got to continue to do that in order to be what we want to be at the end of the year. Uh, when you take a look at, uh, and especially a lot of Prairie View fans want to know, camp battles. Uh, are there any position battles that you're really looking forward to, especially now that the pads are on? Yeah, they all, all on battle. We told everybody coming into camp day one, from quarterback to linebacker to DNs to wide receiver, all the positions. We told them everybody has an opportunity to start. Now how you go out and make that happen all depends on you. Uh, any names and faces that have popped thus far? Yeah, I mean, Trezon, uh, I, again, I mean, we, we know what he's about. We know what he did last year. Uh, one thing I love about him this year, we, we sent him and um, CJ to a, a camp uh, this year in uh, Atlanta. Learn a lot of things from there on the field and in the classroom. And uh, you can definitely tell that he's paying attention. Went out, got some uh, individual work on his own every Tuesday as well. So he's honing in on what he needs to do as a quarterback to be better than he were last year. And as you guys know, you know, without a quarterback, making making that offense go, you know, we, we can't get it done. O-line is O-line. You know, Anton Taylor, you know, uh, Lewis, Kobe Lewis, those guys are big across the board. 
they're doing well. You guys know about our backfield, Ahmad, you know, Caleb. I mean, guys, seeing them dudes just jump cut through some things, man, I'll be looking back like, guys, dang, did y'all see that? I mean, they look really, really good. I mean, defensively, D-line flying around, man, you know, and that, you guys know, we went out, we did heavy, heavy recruiting with that D-line. Man, these guys, uh, I think we got some good ones. We got some really good ones. Let me go back to the run backs, especially as a tandem, Ahmad Antoine and Caleb Johnson. How excited are you in terms of uh, looking forward to what they bring to the offense? Oh, I'm very excited. As, as I said, man, from day one, you know, um, again, these guys have been here all summer working out, and you can tell from day one to day four where we're at right now, they, these guys are doing very good. And they also got Connor, Connor Wisham. Who's doing? Who bust a couple of big ones uh, two days ago? So we got a backfield that's ready to go, man. We just again, we're just switching them in and out. That's that old say, you know, pick your poison. I think we that good. We are that good in the backfield where we can rotate guys, keep them fresh, and and, and and score some points and run the ball, you know, and get some yardage. Sure thing. Thank you. This is Doctor Ville inside the HBC Sports Lab. You're just listening to the interview with Charles Bishop. Uh, interviewing head coach for a and University uh, in regards to football camp. Charles, just give us insight in terms of what are you seeing down there? You know, uh, I, and I think this was a very interesting point that was brought out to me, that this Prairie View team is a veteran ball club. Uh, a lot of people have talked about Texas Southern being a veteran ball club and everything sort of pointing to this year. Uh, but this is uh, an offensive line that's coming back intact. Uh, with, with uh, three or four starters uh, across the uh, front. And then you have this backfield. Keep in mind, Prairie View led the league in rushing last year, and then they add Caleb Johns from Mississippi Valley State. So you're, you're talking about a team that was uh, in their five losses last year. Uh, they were uh, up at halftime in three of those five losses. Uh, the, I think the theme going forward is how do they go about finishing? And if they have you know, fresh running backs going into the fourth quarter, they could pre present some problems for some teams, you know. Uh, and then you add the fact that Trazon Conley also is an athletic quarterback as well, uh, and, and he has some real weapons uh, on the outside. So this is going to be a really fun and interesting team to watch, and they're quietly going about the business over there. Nobody's really talking about Prairie View. They could be a very, very much a super team. Exactly. Exactly. Mike, any uh, thoughts in addition of what you heard that's going on out there or in regards to what Charles just shared? Yeah. So I was at their signing day and one of the things they really stress and CB, you probably had a front row to see this was their, their, their wide receivers. You, you mentioned Caleb Johnson and the running game. They bought some size to that wide receiver position. A couple of six, three, six, four, big body possession receivers. Did you get a sense for how they, and, and the question that came is, can they get, can they get separation? Did you get a chance to see that early on in the season, you know, in this practice stage, you know, things are getting a little competitive up front, but for those six, three, six, four big body receivers, did you get a chance to see, you know, are they going to bring a certain element to this offense as well? I think we're getting to that point where we're going to start seeing a little bit more competition, especially offense versus defense, ones versus ones. Uh, and, and probably this first week, uh, you're starting to get into a little bit of that. I'm sure there'll probably be a scrimmage this weekend, but some yeah. of those questions will probably be answered after this weekend. But you mentioned it, they have size on the outside and they have a quarterback that's been in the system three years now. Uh, and the question is, can he make the leap? from last year uh, to this year to really vault Pro Prairie View into the thick of things, into the SWAC West. Like I said, it came down to one game a season last year Mississippi, against Mississippi Valley, didn't get it done. But the question is, can you get back over to hunting? This is a team with championship pedigree. Remember, they were in the 2021 SWAC championship game. Good points, good points. One final question I have for you is uh, you talked about, or uh, Mike talked about the height and uh, of the wide receivers. What about, you see a little speed out there? I do see quite a bit of speed out there. <laughs> hey, and you know what? There's another addition. Not all, not just, not just nephew out there. Nephew's fast. But guess who else? They have Brian Jenkins from Alabama a yeah, uh, That's all yes, I saw that. So <laughs> they, got they, they, they got some guys in the slot that can give you some real issues. So, right. like I said, they're, they're, they're quiet. as going, well. Yeah. yeah funny because you got the right, hype and the speed, yeah. so it'll be interesting. And I, I, what I thought was interesting, what you said, is 
how much they are under the radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and number four in the be, West. What yeah, number three? Some four people, four. some people have fifth. <laughs> yeah, number and, four, and like four, I said, I, I think this is, and this is a point I can't underscore uh, more. I mean, it's a veteran ball club. They've been there and they've done that. They had some injuries last year, kind of slipped back uh, a little bit to the pack last year, but. Uh, they were in the 2021 uh, SWAT championship game, and a lot of that team is still with them. So uh, they're, they're a very interesting team to watch. It is going to be fun, this Labor Day Classic with Prairie View and Texas it. Southern, because both have kind of met to get to this point uh, in terms of where they are in the program. So uh, let the chips fall where they may, uh, Labor Day Classic. Yep. Yeah, we'll be able to share a little bit about Texas Southern. We're going to switch it to the hardwood in terms of interview we were looking forward to Thursday, but we'll get a chance to mix in also some football talk in this area from Texas Southern, give you some updates there. Shout out to Edwin D. Moore. He asked a good question, 66-4, do, uh, with that height, do they have some hands uh, with that height? And that's the question of the day, always a big one. Chris Tucker says Virginia Union University is in the house. I know they're getting really excited as uh, they have some uh, plans in the mix in terms of what they want to get done this year. So fascinating. Last year, they got the bid to the playoffs, but they did not necessarily get a chance to crown uh, and earn its championship. It was fascinating to see what that looks like. Can they take that next step? Very focused team, so a lot of things going on. Uh, before we turn the page and take our second break, um, anything else you're hearing out there in the mix in regards to um, some of the football teams, anything standing out to you, Charles, uh, across the HBCU landscape? The quarterback competition at Jackson State. I think that's a big question yep. uh, that, that they have to get answered in camp. Uh, they got three viable candidates, uh, all transfers coming into the program. Uh, but you're you're talking about uh, trying to replace uh, the, the 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 shoes of Shador Sanders, uh, and that was that's three thousand some odd yards and forty touchdowns that's no longer in the program. So. Who is the person who can step into those shoes? And I think we get a lot of questions answered. I think Jackson State had their first scrimmage this past weekend, uh, but that 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 that's an ongoing battle within camp. The Valley, Carl Evans says the Valley is in the building. With that being said, Mike, what are you hearing across the landscape that uh, is getting your interest in terms of summer uh, people in their summer workouts as they start getting prepared for this fall season? Well, num no, number one, uh, the uh, you know, just teeing off what CB said, I saw a couple of tweets uh, uh, about the quarterback controversy at um, at, at Jackson State, um, and each of them brings kind of a unique skill set. I, you know, he was talking, you know, CB was talking that they had a chance to scrimmage, but they were in some uh, some of the tweets and some of the they were talking about some of the skill sets. So depending on what kind of offense. Depending on who performs the best, you don't know who really who's going who's going to yield that 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 offense from Jackson State. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. The other one I'm looking for is the FAMU uh, piece. I go back to them. You know, I talk about you know I give the analogy of the Roy Jones uh, Mel uh, Tarper fight, and you know Tarper asked Roy, "What's your you know you you haven't heard much lately." Uh, at least the last week or so coming from FAMU camp. But you're hearing some rumblings about that defense and how strong it's going to be. So I'm wanting to see how strong, how strong that FAMU defense is going to be uh, and how motivated they are this season to really, really prove the point. They're, you know, they're, you know, they're one of the tops. They're picked. But, you know, can they back it up starting with game one? So that's kind of the, some of the rumblings I'm kind of listening to. In addition to – you know, Prairie View being kind of under ranked slow. The other one is, what's up with Southern? You know, we, you know, Southern was picked tops, top, you know, tops to come out on the West by some. You know, who's who? Who's going to be quarterback uh, for Southern? Uh, I heard there there may be a little bit of con uh, QB trans uh, controversy at Southern as well. Interesting, interesting, good stuff coming out of there with the talk uh, before we go into break. You talk about two matchups that go a long way in terms of the swag standing, and they start out, out in week one, Labor Day weekend, Labor Day class with Texas Southern the Prairie View, and then we jump right back into it with Jackson State and FAMU week one in the swag. 
But Jack State gets a little head start. They said, not so fast. We're not worried about week one. We got week zero, which is the me x Quack challenge against South Carolina State. And you already heard the folks are already ready, ready for that week zero to get their fix in regards to that. Before we go to this break, I did want to give a special shout out. Uh, we have a listener, our list, lab listening in here. Uh, he's over the HBCU Center. I won't share his name because he hadn't put it out there, but I want to shout him out. He is celebrating his 70th birthday inside the sports lab. Special shout out, special shout out to the lab listeners celebrating 70 years. We uh, love you. have many, many he, more. He, he, want to give you he celebrates 70. He's been, he been 29 for about 70 years. He, he just going strong. <laughs> he like me. Like a fine wine. Hats off. <laughs> there you go. We'll get into it. We'll be right back on the other side. Uh, as we finish our second break, hope you la- uh, enjoyed some of the insight in terms of HBCU football is coming up as Charles got you some great interview pits. Again, send us some if you want us to put them on. Send it to me uh, on Messenger and we'll get it on. With that, we'll come back on the other side after this second break. That's a pretty tight spot. Watch this. Of course your view works itself. That's so you. It's just up here on the right. Of course you know where we're going. That's so you. Kind of got a sixth sense. And a head-up display. They're here. Hit the field. Warm up. You brought all these players in your Buick? Yeah. So you. It is. There's a Buick that fits your life. Because at the heart of every Buick SUV is you. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. Them belly full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got a Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, brother hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download we look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love you. Yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We're back for our third segment with Charles Bishop and Mike Washington. Let's put on our, our professor caps, if you would. Let's go into the lab. You know, we like to talk a little business. We're going to take it off the field with the great interview you had there, Charles, and your thoughts in terms of this mix. But unless you've been asleep, obviously, um, in the other historically white college universities, those conferences uh, at the Power Five level, you've seen some churning. We like to call it conference churning uh, over here from that perspective. But obviously, in terms of expansion and collapse almost of one conference it looks like you know the power five the five conference pac 12 sec acc big 12 and big 10 um 
you saw that uh, the change happened this week. I actually went back to Colorado, uh, um, went back to the Big 12. Maybe not a big hit scratcher for a lot of folks. Obviously, we understand the connection there with Coach Prime. I loved his comments in regards to his thought oh, yeah. process uh, about these conferences, ch you know, chasing the bag, which a lot of us understood that this is about money and the television driving it. That I don't think that's new to too many people, uh, but we can explore that a little bit. Uh, but I love the fact that he turned it in terms of the grown folks, if you would, uh, <laughs> about them chasing the bags from conferences and moving around. They're right. But his contention in a lot of ways is, but a lot of y'all also will chastise these young men in regards to them chasing the bag. He's, how does that work? And then he got a little dig as he likes to do uh, with the <laughs> Oregon coach. I thought was perfect. I said, man, he's a bag <laughs> of Nick. So it'll be fascinating to see what that looks like. But more than that, what I really wanted to get into is to see how this affects HBCUs. Um, one of the things that people had some concerns and complaints out there particularly with this latest iteration, obviously two teams went to the Big Ten, Oregon, as well as Washington. They follow USC, uh, UCLA. Uh, this seemed to some degree a reaction, a Big Ten in a direct conversation, if you will, or conflict, competition, however you want to look at it, with uh, SEC picking up Texas and Oklahoma uh, and from that. And then Big 12, was able to survive when they picked up four institutions. Uh, and then they picked up what many people refer to as the four corner schools uh, as well. For that mix. Well, obviously, people get to talking on Twitter and all those different things. And I got some direct tweet. Um, and I'm glad that people even come to me to ask the question as if I, you know, study this enough <laughs> and they want my opinion. So the question for there was hypothetically, if we were able to add, and he's referring to we as the SWAC, Howard, North Carolina a and Tennessee State, and Hampton. Uh, would this be attractive enough to generate TV revenue to offset additional travel costs for all sports? And I think that's an intriguing conversation when a lot of the revenue, obviously, it wouldn't change anything for the HBC. You go unless there's a clause in the contract already, a kicker, this is if you expand that you'll expand the money. Uh, but I understand that clause is not in there. But you do have the ESPN deal coming up. So it's interesting to see how that would negotiate. Uh, but one of the things that I challenge with that is, and I purposely opened up with this kind of war, if you would, with SEC and the Big Ten. Sports is about competition. So even if you take it from a conference perspective, uh, one of the things that makes it work is the fact that you have the SEC doing some things and then the Big Ten answering, you know, as if there is this competition. Well, if you take the competition out, if you would, from the MEAC, meaning you take Howard, uh, in terms of that, with only six teams in football, what does that do to the conference? And therefore, what does that do to the MEAC spike challenge and the revenue associated with that matchup? What does it do with the celebration of all and the revenue uh, associated with that? So even if you get the additional television revenue, um, it's not likely to offset not only the travel, but also how does it affect the MEAC SWAC challenge? So I think one thing is, yeah, there's a unique thing, and I do support expansion, and you openly talk, heard me talk about looking at Tennessee State, Clark Atlanta, and them moving up. Obviously, there's some challenges there. With Hampton, North Carolina, AT, they just made their move. I'm sure they're going to be focused on the Colonial, which is now the Coastal. Uh, and then Tennessee State, obviously, is seen to be married to the OVC. And let me get this out there is no legislative rule that requires Tennessee State to stay in the OVC. That's a choice that the president, uh, the board, and the athletic director have made. So uh, make sure we get that clear. But with that talking about, with us, with all that being said, I should say, I'm going to go to you, Mike. What is your general thought in terms of expansion, whether that's the MEAC, the SWAC? You've already seen recent expansion at SIEC, um, and you see uh, Talladega looking to move up from NIA to Division II, so it looks like they're talking about expansion. Uh, SIEC uh, with different sports, do you see them potentially expansion? 
expanding with uh, CIAA. Virginia State plays baseball. But the CIAA doesn't offer baseball. When you look at any of the conference, what are your thoughts in terms of expansion? Will this trickle down and affect HBCUs? The, the the higher level overarching question is yes, I, I think it will. Um, am I a fan of expansion? Absolutely. The the one caveat, the one nugget, uh, CB and Doctor Bills, to me, I think it's going to look different for HBCUs. You mentioned, you know, for instance, the SWAC. You know, is Tennessee State? You know, is you know, you know, do you pull a school out of Atlanta? And also, I think the other thing is the notion that we look at uh, those factors that we look at when we're talking expansion. For a time, we were talking about regionally. Does it make sense? Do you consider these other schools? But let's take in let's take in point the the ACC. When you got Stanford and Cal going to the ACC, you going across country. That means geographically. They're looking, they're, they're saying, okay, they still, you know, their parents can still come see their kids on TV. It's about revenue. It's a different mindset, I think, with, with conference expansion than what we looked at three, four, five years ago. And if you take now, if you go back to the SWAC, it now may make sense to look at not only Tennessee State, not only uh, Clark Atlanta, but, you know, what what would it mean if we brought you know, a Hampton, uh, not a Hampton, I'm sorry, but a Howard or another school to that, you know, what would it mean now? Do we look at that differently? So I think from a, from, you know, from a holistic standpoint, I think we look at it now differently than we looked at when we were having this discussion four years ago, because it was about regionally budgets, other schools. What about their baseball team? What about their basketball team? Can you travel them now? It seems to me that 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 playing field, that field of discussion has leveled out. If you look at mm-hmm. where some of the power five schools are going, you, I mean, you you know, geographically, that kind of has been thrown out the window because of what multimedia deals are going. Heck, the Big Ten deal, I think they're going to also they're going to what share one, you know, one billion dollar revenue sharing in their media package. The yes. other thing is. Uh, the other thing you got to look at is a- in the ACC. You got traditional members saying that, "Hey, we were founding. We bring more value to this, even with the expansion. If that happens in an HBCU expansion, will you have that same argument? Let's say you bring Tennessee State, or you gonna have, you know, are you gonna have Jackson State? Bring, hey, we bring more value. We need to get more of this revenue. So it brings mm-hmm. a different set of questions to me as well." That's how I think it impacts HBCUs. Charles, I, I see you perked up. Uh, get your thoughts in there in terms of concerns with travel. Again, you know, what does this look like and how does this affect the MEAC SWAC Challenge? The Celebration Bowl, the uniqueness between the rival, and the MEAC and SWAC. I mean, there is a lot of great um, <laughs> fun, I'll put it that way, that you see on the social media between MEAC SWAC challenge swag talking about can they ever win another celebration mode hell you even had the commissioner getting in there talking about yeah we gonna focus on the celebration mode because y'all y'all go y'all go find a way to win some games how to put more money in your pocket you better spend no football so we can win a celebration mode so i thought that was funny but i want to get your thoughts in terms of your concerns or do you think as mike said that now you look at it differently can you get enough money uh from espn uh, with the expansion in such a way, whether it's just keeping it more regional with the Tennessee State, um, Clark Atlanta, or is it even a Tuskegee in Clark Atlanta or uh, Albany State, one of the larger HBCUs in the SIEC? I know Commissioner over there in the SIEC is going to be like, I'm going to get a call from him this evening. So, okay, what, what, you, what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, leave our schools alone. But what are your thoughts? That's a that's a really interesting point Mike made in terms of where we are now as opposed to where we are where we were four or five years ago, especially pre celebration ball. Uh one thing I've always said, you know, our, our biggest asset is also our biggest weakness, and that's fan bases being of a traditionalist mindset. So mm-hmm. I don't see how 
all the expansion going on at the power five level does not somehow trickle in now to the mindset of what can we do here at the HBC level? And it's, it's tantalizing to think about the quote unquote super conference or looking at Tennessee state Hampton, uh, North Carolina A&T being a part of this, uh, this HBC stratosphere. Um, but I, I guess part of the concern for me is I, I still have some of that, that, that traditionalist pull to, me. you know, now I've become fond of the celebration bowl and swag versus the MIAC and the MIAC swag challenge. And, and it's, it's going to take a, you know, a, a little harder pull for me to, you know, to, to lose that framework. Uh, but I'm excited about it because one thing that I actually thought about was like, okay, let's say this 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 comes to fruition. Uh, how are, from a regionality standpoint, how are things set up? Do you do it like the NFL now where, you know, you have the NFC East, West, the AFC East, West, North, South. Uh, is there that sort of look-see in terms of how you go about making this happen and still in some manner keep the rivalries and keep, again, one of the biggest assets, the tradition, still part of this HBCU strategy? Yep. Yeah, that is one of the challenges when you talk about whether it's divisions or pods, how do you set up in such a way that you keep that uh, tradition there in regards to that? Uh, we're going to take our last break, come back to the other side, but I want to ponder this because I want you to go into GCAC. We're going to look at it from NAIA perspective. And I'll come back on the other side. I have one final question on expansion that I want you to consider at that level. We're going to share some love with the uh, private institutions, uh, those in the NIA part of the Gold Coast Athletic Conference. And then we can get some final ties on some of your thoughts in terms of the SIEC showdown uh, that has been moved and get your thoughts in terms of what that looks like. So stick with us. We'll be back on the other side, talk a little more about the expansion. We're going to take a special look at GCAC uh, when we talked about the four other HBCUs, but what does it mean to them? Uh, and then also we'll talk a little bit more about the television schedule. With that being said, stick with us. We'll take our last break, come back on the other side. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slowburn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, Boy, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Wills inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Uh, Professor Bishop, wanted to get your thoughts on the GCAC. Obviously, it is expanded recently with the University of Virgin Islands. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you see continued expansion? Obviously, you have the Red River uh, Athletic Conference that has several HBCU programs. 
And a couple of years ago, Wiley College, that was previous of the Red River Athletic Conference, moved over and joined the GCAC, seemed to have a lot of success. Obviously, we saw what their baseball program did um, last year and then moved into the uh, Black College World Series and had a good run of things. Do you see maybe some potential other HBCU programs formerly uh, that are currently in the Red River Athletic Conference, Jarvis Christian, uh, Houston Tillerson University, Texas yeah. College, maybe even Paul Quinn College, considering moving over similar to Wiley College in terms of expansion of GCAC with a lot of stuff they're doing. Obviously, uh, commissioners doing significant in terms of brand awareness, yeah. on the social media platform, giving uh, programming out there to those schools. What are your thoughts in terms of continued expansion at that level for the GCAC? Well, certainly, if I'm if I'm president of any of those schools, especially HBCUs uh, housed right now in the Red River or, uh, Conference, uh, it's intriguing uh, because you see some of the things that the GCAC is doing, especially uh, the, the the so you mentioned it, the, the social media branding, uh, the Urban Edge Network uh, uh, deal that they, that they have now. Uh, it's a, a progressive conference, and you start to see some of the things that uh, that they are doing. So, if I'm a president, obviously, I'm going to be kind of taking a look and like. Hmm. You guys on move over there. It's it's worth taking a look at, and I guess you, uh, especially with regards to the, the media deal, that that is an intriguing piece to the puzzle over there with the GCAC in terms of some of the things that are bringing more eyeballs to the conference. Mike, what are your thoughts? Expansion GCAC. You think the, some of the HBCUs uh, in Red River Athletic Conference in Texas will take a second look at GCAC over there? Oh, without <clears throat> without question, <clears throat> I think it was uh, the uh, Commissioner Barnes what spoke on this latest this latest uh, media network launch. You know, just you know, just a few weeks ago, I guess maybe a week ago. Um, and with with the media launch, with the expanded branding, uh, why would it not be attractive to some school like a Langston or Jarvis Christian to join that? The the opportunity or the flirtation with conference sharing expanded media coverage, expanded visibility, that's like a drug. And yeah. so it, it, it would be behoove presidents to say, I want a hit of that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, maybe that's a bad, but, <laughs> but it would behoove presidents to say, let's see what we need a fix. <laughs> yeah, I need a fix. I, I think it's more straightforward, to be honest, in this case than it would be <clears throat> for maybe the SWAC or the MEAC. Uh, it, it would be almost kind of a no brainer if, you know, the GCAC continues on its path, building its brand identity, it's building its visibility. Why would it not consider to expand its boundaries, build its footprint, and at the same time give those schools exposure? At the same time, it's almost a win-win situation from a business standpoint. And the valuation you of that thing, conference girls. The, the unique thing about it also is the fact, unlike you were talking about with uh, Stanford from California, maybe even SMU, it sounds like. I wonder if they're going to throw in rice uh, mm. stuff, since they uh going looking all in, intrigued with that stuff. You're talking about the bi-coastal travel, obviously, uh, with that thing that becomes unique, GCAC, if you get enough schools, you can get into your divisions and you can actually do what you saw in the SWAC. We yeah. expanded, but you expanded in strategic in such a way where you reduce travel in terms of how you uniquely schedule and you schedule in terms of your divisions uh, opening it up. So those things are unique, too, if you can expand in a certain way you may be even to reduce it in such a way that you actually save costs. Talking about cost and television, uh, last week we talked about the expanded television platforms of the number of SWAT games on ESPN and how many more games they're covering. Uh, we see now the SIC showdown will be aired on ESPN2 in 2023. Um, the SIC is pleased to announce a significant event the ongoing collaboration with ESPN, a thrilling regular season football game is going to be televised on ESPN2 in October. ESPN has handpicked an exciting matchup that was showcased Florida, uh, Fort Valley State, taking on Benedict on Thursday, October 12th, kickoff at 7.30. On Thursday, October 12th, all eyes will be on Charlie W. Johnson Stadium 
as it steps into the national spotlight. Previous year encountered witnesses the Tigers roaring to a commanding 45-13 victory over the Wildcats, marking their first triumph against Fort Valley State since 2018. SAIC regular season ESPN linear games. You have Fort Valley State, Tuskegee on ESPNU, but Fort Valley State Benedict steps up, moves from ESPNU to ESPN2. What are your thoughts in terms of the number of coverage for the ESPN in terms of covering more HB uh, SWAT games in general? And then also you see at the SIC that you're moving up a linear niche, moving from ESPNU to ESPN2. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of the rationale? What do you see out there that is culminating to see this change? And is it significant uh, going with you, Charles? What are your thoughts in terms of what are you hearing these moves? Uh, my guess is somebody's looking at the numbers and seeing that it is it is a significant move uh, to 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 air or to televise that game in particular, and, and you get a great matchup uh, when you're talking about Benedict and Fort Valley. So uh, it is you know uh, these things aren't done in a silo, uh, Doctor Bill. Uh, uh, this thing has been studied, and and it, it, is, it is a viable uh, option to move it up to the next platform. So uh, kudos to ESPN for that. Well, man, his sports studies at the master science. He finished the program <laughs> there. He said, we tell you about the business yeah. side. It's a mess, method to my madness, if you would. Mike, what are your thoughts in terms of you seeing the number of games on ESPN and now the second week matchup where you even see games being flexed moving from ESPNU to ESPN2? Well, you saw I, that also I, with the uh, MIAC SWEC Challenge, just to throw it out there, that moved uh, from ESPN. Yeah. to now ABC. ABC, yeah. I, I think um I think ESPN, the conglomerate that they are now, uh to echo what CB was saying, that, that decision was not made behind closed doors. There, there, there are, there's number, there's numbers, there's statistics, there's data points and looking in that show it's more viable to move it up to a higher platform, a more visible platform for some reason. Either the numbers, the potential revenue Whatever the case, there's reasons that ESPN has started to move this games up. The, the the conference is definitely benefiting from this from an exposure point alone. Um, if you look, you know, you know, John, you know, I'll say Professor John Grant said, <laughs> Yeah, it's good to have butts in the seats, but you want eyes on that television. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the name of the business. So I think from from, a, from just from a pure pure valuation and business standpoint, I think it's nothing but good. But I think ESPN is seeing something in their numbers that's saying, "Hey, let's move these let's move these kids up. Let's move them up to to the bigger playground. Let's give them more more visibility. Let's let's move them from ESPN U to ESPN two, or let's move them on ASP uh, ABC. They don't make that decision lightly. Trust me, from a business standpoint." Um, you look at how they move baseball games or college baseball games around. You look at how they move basketball games. They don't take those decisions lightly. And for them to move those those games up to different platforms, meaning there's some numbers that we probably don't even have enough time to talk about that are driving that. And I hopefully my 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 closing point is hopefully we in the SIAC. CIAA, whatever, can take advantage of that visibility. Now, um, from a branding and from a from a, an expansion standpoint, hopefully we can take advantage of that as well. Great point. Um, speaking of John Grant, he talks about the need to make sure that you make the ads. When you get on these televisions, using the phone to go back to your lungs, celebrating the fact you're on know, television, but making sure you make the ad in terms of the advancement office, the communication office under the president, they soliciting the funds to continue to support. Closing up things here, I did want to get out. Told you we'll do some basketball talk a little bit, sneak that in amongst this uh, football. I know we got football madness, uh, but a and announced their basketball schedule. Uh, they face against uh, HBCU out of the SWAC, Alabama State. They also have a matchup against the rival North Carolina Central. Uh, but the other one that excites me a little bit, because I'll get to see this, or at least on schedule, uh, to go down there is Las Vegas. So we'll be going back to Las Vegas, North Carolina A&T. Uh, we'll face on Texas Southern on Saturday. The tough thing about that, that is in the MGA Grand Garden Arena. That's Chris Paul classic that you know about. 
We'll be in Atlanta for the Celebration Bowl, but it looks like I'll have to get up early in the morning again, catch a flight out of there on Sunday, uh, as we'll see Texas Southern facing Hampton. A&T will face Jackson State University. So mm. fascinating to see that matchup there. I'm kind of excited to see what goes on hardwood as they get into some of those matchups. Obviously, they have their conference game against Hampton. Um, so they got a couple of HBCUs in there, and then they have one against Cheney. Uh, in terms of the Division II level HBCU program. So wanted to get out there, get a little basketball talking. I'm looking forward to those matchups. Uh, you know I love to see the cross matchups basketball between various HBCUs, so I'm, I'm intrigued about what that will look like. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Yannick Lille, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from Inside the Lab and the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. We look forward to discuss more of the latest news of HBCU sports. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's D-R- K-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside HBC Sports Lab 1 on Facebook and YouTube. That's HBC, Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, as you know, Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you, with you soon. Charles? Of course. Mike? Lecture. Dismiss.